I'm Liza Mundy. I'm the head of New America's Breadwinning and Caregiving Program, which is our fancy name for our work family program. Uh, we are very happy to have with us from Los Angeles, Salita Reynolds, who is the general manager of the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. We're going to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to the heart of every working parent, which is how you get from place A to place B to place C in the course of a single day, which is something that we all have to do. And in cities, uh, there are particular challenges, but I think there are also um, really innovative and wonderful opportunities that are changing the lives of people and changing the face of cities. Uh, Salita is also on the advisory board of WTS International, which is an organization of female transportation planners that seeks to nurture women in leadership roles and drive more women into what is a very male-dominated field. And these women are producing a lot of the innovative solutions to work family and transportation challenges uh, and literally changing the face of cities around the United States. Uh, just to elaborate a little bit on your bio, uh, Salita is, uh, as, as head of the Department of Transportation, she's responsible for managing over 65 100 miles of streets, that's 6,500 miles of streets, 26 million trips on dash buses, 35,000 parking meters, and the most advanced traffic signal system in the country with 4,500 traffic lights. She's responsible for implementing Great Streets for Los Angeles, which is a plan to reduce traffic deaths, double the number of people riding bikes, and expand access to transportation choices for Angelinos and the region. Uh, we're really glad that you're here. We hope that you left somebody in charge. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few people. Okay, good. So LA is still is still moving mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Good. Traffic signal's still on. Okay, that's great. Traffic is still in Los Angeles. <laughs> right, okay. Everybody relax. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, uh, as I said, as a working parent uh, who lives in the suburbs and works in the city, uh, the, just the daily logistics of getting around is a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Also, now as the parent of teenagers uh, who have been learning to drive, it's a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, and whenever I think about sort of cities and work family logistics, my memory is drawn actually to the morning of 9-11, uh, September 11, 2001. I had two young children who were both in school, uh, in different schools, one in preschool, one in elementary school. My husband that morning had already left um, for his job in national security. He was already in a vault in DC. Uh, when I had dropped my son off at preschool and heard over the radio what was happening, and it was you know not clear to, really at that point what was happening, there was a lot of, um, confusion and panic, obviously, and I didn't know whether to pick up my kids or whether they should shelter in place, whether I should go to work. I worked for a newspaper. This was news. Uh, and, and, but I knew that I didn't want to have a tunnel, a metro tunnel, or a bridge in between myself and my children on a day like 9-11, so I made the choice to pick up my kids, to take them to my house, to let my boss know that I was going to try to work from home at a time when it wasn't that uh, when, when it wasn't that common to do so. I knew I wasn't going to see my spouse for a long time that day. Um, I, I had friends who were already in D.C., and, and I, I, I tried to reach them to say I could pick up their children from school. Uh, they were already walking across the Key Bridge to try to get back to Arlington to their kids. Meanwhile, our neighbors had very young children in daycare in the Pentagon. They were both employed by the Pentagon but did not work in the Pentagon. So they were also separated from their children. And, and the mother finally commandeered a vehicle just to drive up to the Pentagon to make sure that their children were safe, and they were. Uh, but I think that day just, just sort of cast into relief the, you know, the really fragile system that we all have, the, the sort of day-to-day -day challenges where you're going to be physically separated from your children, from your partner if you have one, and your children are also probably physically separated from each other if there's a couple years between them. And so it just casts into relief the challenges that we all face every day. At the same time now, as the parent of teenagers uh, learning how to drive, um, I, I have seen a lot of changes in cities that we're going to talk about today. So it, it seems even a very different environment than it was uh, 14 or 15 years ago. So I thought I would, the first question I would ask is that I'm not one of the people who believes that the world will automatically be better if women you know, are running it, although it would be great to have more women running more parts of it. But how, do, as we get more women in charge of major transportation systems in cities, 
how do things change, if at all? And, and let's say you're a working parent, and when you moved to Los Angeles, you mm -hmm. had to make a decision about where you were going to live and how your work day was gonna, was gonna unfold. Yeah, and, and before I get to that, just a word about disasters and, and what they teach us about transportation. Um, a while ago, a few years ago, Washington, D.C. had an earthquake um, and as I you know, somebody who's lived for the last 17 years uh, on the West Coast in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle, we all you know felt for you, but also had a little chuckle at your expense. Um, and that okay, the bottles, the, time, the bottles rattled on the shelves. Okay. Never forget. Hashtag never forget. Um, <laughs> the the thing the thing that was fascinating to me is that uh, Washington D.C. had just launched Capital Bike Share. Uh, not long before that, and that was the, the day where there was the single biggest sort of spike in use uh, for bike sharing. You could see kind of bike share sort of struggling along, and then on that day, um, it just went to the heavens. So, you know, it told us a lot about what kind of safety nets exist huh. Huh. Uh, when major disasters strike, and they are not always the things that come front of mind. No. Um, and when I tell my emergency preparedness guys that we, we got to get bike share because earthquake, um, they you know, look at me kind of cross-eyed. But uh, the, the, to, to answer your um, original question, um, Mayor Garcetti just released, uh, Mayor, Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles just released uh, the first of three reports on the status of women and girls in Los Angeles. Um, and one of the pieces of that was about women in leadership in government. In particular, currently there is only one woman um, on the Los Angeles City Council. Uh, and uh, the mayor has made it a point um, to try and rectify that in the leadership roles and particularly in non-traditional departments. So there's a, a woman who manages the Department of Water and Power, uh, Department of Transportation. He has appointed about 50% of the general managers um, and commissioners he's appointed have been women. Um, so I think that it, we have yet to see what kind of results uh, will come from that kind of intentional placement of women in leadership roles. Um, but what I will say is that uh, in the last five or 10 years, there has been a complete sea change in transportation in particular, how we think about uh, incorporating uh, public health, injury prevention, uh, uh, the childhood obesity epidemic, economic development into transportation, um, sort of most notably uh, in New York under the leadership of Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who was a, tr uh, a commissioner of transportation under uh, Mayor Bloomberg. She really changed the game and changed the playbook that we use to design streets. Um, and really what she did was to create the kind of environment where women in particular um, and children sort of and older adults, people 8 to 80, would feel more comfortable getting on a bike um, and would be safer, measurably safer walking. Um, the current commissioner, Polly Trottenberg, has carried that into um, a strong focus on Vision Zero, which is sort of a radical goal to get to zero traffic deaths um, in a very short amount of time. Because in a lot of our cities now, we have more people dying trying to get around town um, than we do uh, from, from sort of homicides and, and gang and gun violence. But we consider that a normal price of getting around town. So I think that what you see in, in some of these cities where women have, have sort of taken on leadership roles is a greater emphasis on safety. Uh, a, a very different approach to the design of the streets and how space is allocated and who the streets are for, who they are there to serve. Um, and then to your question about moving to Los Angeles, uh, because I'm in transportation, um, the very first thing I thought is that I wanna live within a, a, a 20 minute transit commute of where I was gonna work. Um, I wanted to live in a neighborhood with an excellent walk score, so I wanted to live in a place where um, myself and my two kids and my husband would be able to walk what or is bike. It, are there, what is a walk score, so exactly? Walk score is this really easy to understand tool that allows you to put in your address and then it gives you a score of zero to 100. And it's based on the number of destinations you could easily reach on foot. So it is a measure, an immediate measure of um, how much time you might have to spend in your car if you lived in that given location. So I wanted a good walk score, I wanted a 20 minute transit commute, and I wanted reasonably uh, acceptable public schools, um, which is, uh, in Los Angeles, that narrows you down to about three neighborhoods, um, depending on where you work. So um, it was a way, first a very practical way to sort of narrow down a very large city, um, but also a recognition that we asked the transportation system to do a lot of heavy lifting. We asked the transportation system to uh, sort of account for the fact that we have a jobs housing mismatch, 
that we have a lack of affordable housing near where people work, right. uh, that we don't have strong quality uh, free public education um, that is universally uh, sort of accessible to folks. Mm -hmm. And so the transportation system has to bear the burden of all of those policy pieces. Um, so I, I think about that a lot in my commute and also when I talk to people because I'm frequently asked to fix traffic um, in Los Angeles and you know I sort of feel like well let's fix wages and affordable housing and then we can and then people can live anywhere then everybody can, can live traffic. close to where they work because sure. every school system is desirable and every right. neighborhood is desirable and there's right. enough housing right. for people to live where they need where they want right. to live right right I thought journalists had to field a lot of complaints and criticisms about their work and I'm afraid I had not thought about the, the plight of the transportation <laughs> planner. Spend some time in government. <laughs> right, right, right. Of course. So, and let's talk a little bit more about the changes that have taken place, the revolution that's taken place in cities because when I look around at DC and I look at the bike lanes and I look at, you know, the changes and I'm really happy to see all of those changes. Um, I don't really think of them as, I think of them as changes that have, that are mostly for the benefit I would say of millennials, actually. Mm -hmm. I think of them as being for the benefit of single, uh, single people. And I have actually said to my 16-year-old son, you know, why don't you bike? Why don't you use the metro system? You don't necessarily need to get your license. In fact, I didn't even have to say that to him. You know, the way that we were all, um, you know, on at, at the D, at the DMV when we were 16 to get our license. He didn't get his license in, for about a year because he didn't feel the need to. But in what way are these revolutionary changes? of benefit to working families, if at mm -hmm. all? So that's not just your son, that's actually a strong trend across. They are deferring, getting their driver's right. licenses, yeah. they own fewer, fewer vehicles, um, and even uh, younger adults as they come into cities because it's impossible to get a job with just an undergraduate degree anymore. You have to have a master's, which means you come into the workforce usually under crushing debt. So right. you literally cannot afford a car, which is a really right. expensive, right. Um, expensive extra thing. You know, I also think about older adults, you know, older adults that uh, would like to and are going to want to age in place, and we have done absolutely nothing to prepare for that. We have not clustered services. Right. We have not built um, places where people can be car light or car free right. um, that meet them where they are. Um, and then I, when I think about working families in particular, I don't so much think about the commute because that is uh, a really complex um, thing to overcome requires heavy investment in really expensive infrastructure. But I think a lot about giving families the opportunity to unplug and spend time with each other and work physical activity into their normal daily lives. And the way that we've designed sort of um, biking and walking infrastructure in this country for the last 50 years has not accommodated that. So, you right. know, there's some great uh, information about what women in particular want. You know, when you look at who bikes in America and in American cities, it's usually uh, three or four to one men to women. You just, we are not, there are not that. a yeah. lot of women yeah. out is on bikes. Is it a heels thing? I mean, is it? Yeah. It's yeah. not, because yeah. when you go to, uh, we can go. I do think get about on a, that. We can, we can get on okay. a bike share bike yeah. after okay. this. Um, when, uh, when you look at uh, Scandinavian countries, Northern yeah. European countries, yeah. it is exactly the opposite. Right. Um, and oh, really? women in those oh. countries drive the transportation decisions, huh. just like women in this country do. So, you know, there, there is, and why is that? Well, I think it, part of it is cultural, clearly, but I think it begins and ends with the infrastructure. When there is nothing between you and moving traffic but a four inch wide white stripe, you are not gonna get on a bike and you're not gonna put your kid on a bike, you know, and right. you're not, and you're definitely not gonna take your parents out right. for a bike ride. And so then you have, um, dramatically uh, reduced the amount of roaming space that you have as a family and, and with your kids on the weekends or when you want to do errands or when you want to uh, you know go to the store go out to eat breakfast go pick up your dry cleaning it all has to happen in a car because the perception of safety is so important for women in particular and that is why that separation uh, that gets built into sort of more progressive or sort of 21st century bike infrastructure has resulted in a dramatic increase in the number of women biking in those cities and in those places where it is. So if you have exists. physical curbs that separate the bike lane from the, you're more likely to get women in you those can, lanes. It can be a physical huh. curb. It can be it can be a plastic bollard. It can be a lane of a row of parked cars. You know, where you flip flop the parking and the bike lane, so the bike lane is is adjacent to the sidewalk. There is a huge toolbox that's available. The trouble is that in built-out cities, 
our most valuable sort of uh, piece of, uh, our most valuable thing is space. Um, space is at a premium, and to give space to something, you must take it from something else, because we are no longer in the business of widening our roads and decking our freeways, and I hope we're not going to be in that business. Um, but, but, but that's sort of where we are. And so, you know, saving lives and achieving these other goals comes at a cost. And that cost is typically, you know, those battles are fought and won and lost at the local neighborhood mm -hmm, level. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting, I just sort of, um, the change in philosophy about sort of who is served by our transportation networks mm -hmm. and who's, who should be prioritized, the idea that, that the most vulnerable are the people who should be served, that, mm -hmm. that we should be thinking about children and the elderly or families, that really is a novel concept, right? I mean, who, what was the thinking 40 or 50 years ago about who was served by our transportation networks? Well, I think that we had this sort of, um, you know, the dream of the automobile it tied into a lot of core American values about independence and freedom. Um, and Los Angeles in particular is a city that is built around the automobile. And um, the idea was, you know, initially when sort of automobiles replaced uh, the cable car systems that we had in a lot of our cities, um, there was this dream of sort of perfect separation. So you could see it in sort of, you know, World's Fair exhibits and, and things like that, um, that, you know, there would be vehicles and then there would be a totally separate set of infrastructure for people walking and more vulnerable users. Right. That never the came elevated, to pass. Right, elevated. Sort you got of it. And yes. you'll see little yes, bits and yes. pieces of it, yes, you know, right. pedestrian crossovers mm -hmm. that nobody uses. Mm -hmm. You see groups of people just like taking their lives in their hands and like running across right. these crazy streets. Right, Rosslyn, Tyson's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even on the strip in Las Vegas, you know, I'll, I'll go there yeah. and you'll see the people, yeah. you know, the tourists will use the escalators and the overcrossings, but the people who work at those yeah. places just every day cash, are yeah. running uh -huh. across the strip down below because they don't want to take the time and the trouble to go over because. It's not efficient if you're right. on foot. Right. Um, so I think that there was that, that was the idea, that you should be able to go wherever you want, whenever you want, as fast as you want. And the safety thinking was around things like seat belts, airbags, the design of the vehicle, and that the, the system design was designed to uh, account for driver error, which actually had the unintended outcome of creating a system that was very easy to drive very fast, wide lanes, mm -hmm. big sloping curves, we think about freeway design. What we found is that gives us exactly the opposite outcome um, of safety when it comes to safety. And in particular, when you look at the people who are involved in, uh, people who are severely injured or die in crashes, um, older adults and children are overrepresented. In fact, half of the people in Los Angeles who died in pedestrian crashes last year were older adults because they are much less likely to be able to overcome a significant injury. And these crashes have real costs. So they have the immaterial costs to our families, to our communities, to our cities, but they also have you know, actual costs because about 75% of the, the, the healthcare costs that come out of those crashes are borne by Medicare and Medicaid. So these are societal costs and they're hidden. Um, that are a direct outcome of the way we've designed our system. And I know that you're referring to them as crashes and not as accidents, right? Because the, there's a philosophy behind that, right? There is. So the idea is, you know, accident is sort of the prevalent word. And the idea is, well, it's an accident. Couldn't have been prevented. Nothing we could have done about it. It's just acceptable. That's just the way it is. Um, the state of the practice in transportation for the last 10 years has been to call them crashes or collisions because they are preventable and right. language really, right. really matters right. to the point where it's such a tick with me now that um, when my husband will say something like to my daughter, it's okay, you spilled that milk, it was just an accident. I'll be like, like it was a was crash. A cr Actually, you're right, <laughs> that was an accident. You're good, I'll allow it. <laughs> You know, I was, I was struck reading a Q&A with you, though, uh, that you talk about, uh, again, part of this philosophy of changing the way we think about who is served by our, our transportation network, that, that it's your job to slow people down, right? So um, for, for the sake of children and the elderly, but as, the, as, as a sort of a working parent who has, you know, had to run from work to the car to drive my kids to, I don't know, a play or wherever they have to be, things move pretty slowly as it is, right? Mm -hmm. But sort of in the wrong situation. So I, when I was teaching my children to drive, I had to reckon with the fact that when they saw me driving, I was often like beating my head against the steering wheel, shouting, go, go, to the person in front of me. Um, and I had to change that behavior. Uh, um, uh, 
so, but, so it's hard, right? Because often we are too slow in, and we're all you know, overwhelmed and living, trying to get from point A to point B. So how do you strike that balance of slowing people down in situations where they should be going slowly, but enabling them to move fast enough that they're not crazed? So I think there's a cultural piece there. You know, um, I describe sort of the driving culture along the West Coast because I've lived you know, in Seattle and spent a lot of time in Vancouver and Portland. And up there, Seattle drivers are the most chill drivers. If you need to get over at the last minute on the freeway, they will wave you over. Oh, you sure, get on over, I'm in no hurry. Because I'm very practical and I left a full hour before I needed to get to my destination, so I am not in a hurry. Um, and there are a lot of narrow streets in Seattle where uh, only one car can, can go and you, you drivers literally have to collaborate to make it work. I have to look you in the eye, you have to look me in the eye, I have to pull over because we're not going to play chicken and let you by and then we both wave at each other, right? And there's a skit on Portlandia that makes yeah, fun know, of that called yeah, No You Go, yeah, No You yeah. Go and they're ordering takeout <laughs> and like trying to, trying to out polite each other. When you get down to the Bay Area, things start to change a little bit. Uh, in the East Bay and Berkeley, people will still stop. At East Durham, my husband crazy like just go, I can wait, just there's nobody behind you. But the driver will stop and wave you across, go, go ahead, cross the street. <laughs> Once you get down to Los Angeles, <laughs> things are different. Uh, people are aggressive. Um, you know, I don't have the exact number, but something like about a quarter of the system is down at any given time because of crashes, because people have been involved in crashes. And so, you know, major parts of the freeway system yeah. closed at yeah. any, on any given commute, here, yeah. commute day, right? Yeah. Um, when I think I've done a lot of work uh, in schools over the years, the Safe Routes to School movement is very well established in this country, great, uh, its wealth, its, its funding has survived multiple transportation bills uh, because it's something people really understand and care about, but a school is like a special event twice mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the very parents who are telling you, because they are public witnesses to a million near hit and misses every day, you have got to do something about this, you have got to slow people down, are exactly the ones, when I give the principal a radar gun, are exactly the ones that yeah. are speeding down the right. street and right. making illegal use, and the same thing happens in neighborhoods. Right. You know, I want you to slow everybody else down. Except me. Except me. Right. Right, so that I can drive as quickly as possible. I want you to get everybody into a bike so that there's no more traffic for me. Um, so there's, there's a real sort of um, fundamental cultural change yeah. that we have to get to and it exists in pockets in this country, so right. I don't think it's out of our reach. Um, and there are great models for cult culture change in transportation. You think about when I was growing up, you didn't wear seat belts. Right. There weren't, you know, I wasn't in a booster seat until yeah. I was, I was in the front seat yeah. when I was three, yeah. four, maybe. Um, you know, and, and that's not the way we do it anymore, and that's not acceptable. Right. So I think that we can get to that place, and I, speed is important because it is a huge predictor of how severe or fatal an outcome is going to be on a street. And that is related to the amount of things you can pay attention to if you're going, say, 25 miles an hour versus 30, 40, 50. Your field of vision just really collapses. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not that speed itself is bad. Mm -hmm. um, and the arrival, I think, of things like uh, connected and driverless vehicles in our cities uh, will have a huge sort of... Um, major seismic shift. You know, you're, right. you're observing things have changed a lot in the last five years. We are right on the cusp of things changing more than they've changed in the last, I'll say, 100, 125 years with the arrival of different kinds of vehicles and also uh, with the arrival of services and technology and sort of the intersection of transportation and technology um, and that I think will, will really change the way that we think about transportation and we think about getting around. That's great. And we need to make sure, obviously, that there's not the same thing as a digital divide when, right. in, in which only sort of middle class and upper class families mm -hmm. are being served by the transportation system. And I know we're, we're just about out of time, but could you point to innovations or cities or places that have done a particularly good job of serving lower income communities or people who are working part time jobs and have to get around from one place to another and, you know, and struggle to find a, a good quality child care center? Mm -hmm. uh, and any, any sort of policy solution or place that you, would, that you would cite? Yeah, I'll say two things. One is the federal government has long had in place a, a funding stream called Jobs Access Reverse Commute Money that cities have used to try and help uh, specifically lower income folks and lower income communities make that reverse commute. They may not be needing to go into the job center, they may be going out to provide care or to provide services um, out in the suburbs. 
And you know that that funding stream has had some moderate success, um, but it's really it's very difficult to provide a uh, to provide a, a sort of time sensitive and time respectful reverse commute affordable option. Right. Um, I think the arrival of things like I mean you're starting to see the beginning of it with things like Uber, Lyft. Um, companies like Bridge, moving towards a service-based model and not a vehicle-based model of how to get around. Um, with the arrival of connected and, and maybe uh, driverless vehicles, I'm hoping that that trend continues. Um, but what I hear when I talk to people all the way from the federal government, federal level on down to the state, is that the market will figure it out. Mm. Don't mm. worry about it, government people. The market will figure it out. Market's not going to figure it out, right? Because on one hand, you have auto manufacturers who are keenly interested in restoring the model of individual vehicle ownership. What they are trying to create is basically a home entertainment system on wheels because consumers right, right. are not interested in the motor underneath anymore. They care about how connected the vehicle is. Right. Can you get Wi-Fi? Is there a TV screen right in front of me while I'm driving, <laughs> et cetera. Um, and so that's where they're, they're trying to go. Then you have companies uh, that are, are sort of inching into this, into this space, like Google, Apple, um, that are, first of all, not accustomed to making products that kill people. And so they are much more safety sensitive. And second of all, not in it to sell cars, um, in it to create really interesting solutions to city problems. And so I think that sort of for two reasons, government needs to be involved. One is to help continue the shift away from individual auto ownership for a whole host of reasons, sustainability, public health, et cetera. Um, but, but also because we don't want people to be left behind. Um, when you think about bike sharing and car sharing and all these services, um, they are not well used in lower income neighborhoods. And part of that is about money, but there's also a cultural barrier there that we don't understand enough about yet. And that is where I think government needs to be involved in making sure that you know, the number of jobs you can get to uh, within 60 minutes um, you know, in a car is dramatically, dramatically higher than on public transit. And so as these sort of service-based models come into cities, we need to make sure that everybody has access to those same sort of uh, same services. Right. Right. So um, I think we're just we are I think out of town uh, out of time. If you could just talk for thirty seconds about how the transportation community reacted to the presidential inauguration, um, okay. as we were talking about in the green room, I think that would be illuminating. To so um, you know, if you uh, live in D.C., which is I love cities, and D.C. is a fantastic city, uh, you've noticed probably that there's been a, a different approach to bike infrastructure. You know, when New York sort of changed the playbook for design. It unleashes huge latent demand, and now there's over 200 in the, in the US of these kind of protected bikeways. And DC was right on their heels um, and built this bikeway down Pennsylvania Avenue. And you know, in the transportation community, we were all like, wow, look at that, it's amazing. Um, and you know, we were very excited. But then to see it during the inauguration, because we had heard that maybe they might have to black out the street and they weren't going to show it, but there it was in all of its glory. I have to tell you, it was just like, you know, the, the Twitter sphere in, in sort of super nerdy transportation uh, circles just went nuts. Um, and of course, the sort of bike advocacy, you know, folks in, in the US also were just, I mean, that picture um, of the president, first lady holding hands and walking and the bike lane was there. Um, it just, it felt like we had arrived. That's great. Um, so it was, yeah, That's it was a great. big deal. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to the thank East you. Coast.